Uh, I'd like to introduce Amir Hussein, who's the founder and CEO of Spark Cognition. He was talking how this has gone in two and a half years, his company from one man in a PowerPoint to over 300 people who are working this very difficult problem of machine learning and AI-driven dri cognitive analysis. Um, he has over 50 patents uh, in his name, some of them not approved yet, but many of them approved. His company won the Global Innovation Award in 2014 and the Nokia Innovation Challenge in 2015. He was personally the uh, Austin Entrepreneur of the Year, um, and he is the author of a new book, which I encourage everyone to read, The Sentient Machine, uh, about these topics that, that we're talking about today. So there's uh, no better person on this topic than Amir Hussein. Amir? David, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I must acknowledge that the early work on the concept of hyperwar was done in collaboration with General John Allen, uh, who was the deputy commander CENTCOM and also commander ISAF. Uh, he's a dear friend and also a great thinker. So I owe him a lot in developing these concepts. Um, the idea behind hyperwar is actually to consider what happens when artificial intelligence fuses with the needs of um, the conduct of war. And this is obviously, this is something that happens across multiple domains and in many different areas. But one of the things that we realized early on was that uh, the relationship between intelligence and firepower is actually an inverse relationship. And what I mean by this is to say that over the last many decades, for example, as we prosecuted bombing campaigns in the Second World War, we found that we had to drop a very large amount of ordnance to take down a target because we lacked accuracy, we lacked intelligence. By the time that the Gulf War came around, we found that we could use a JDAM kit and transform something that was not very smart previously and was now very smart, and that one kinetic element could take the place of a much larger number of dumb, unguided bombs. Okay, so this is a very basic example, but in your military uh, discipline, you can abstract this all over. Uh, whether you watch somebody you know, exercise martial arts or whether you see a B-52 versus a, J a single JDAM being dropped somewhere, the principle that's working there is that intelligence and firepower have an inverse relationship. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because in the age of hyperwar, one of the biggest changes that will happen is that decision-making will become federated inexpensive, embeddable, universal, uh, and also capable of collaborating in hive minds as swarms, ways in which decisions haven't yet been made, you know, in conventional warfare. So we can talk about weapon systems, and we can talk about the new Chinese AI-powered missile, and we can talk about what we'll do to counter that, and we can talk about where the gaps are and the S-400 and what we'll do to counter that, which, of course, we'll get into those things here uh, later on. But always keep in mind that the fundamental thing that's happening here is that the same size of force, if it could take X decisions previously, a competent force of some size could take X decisions previously, the injection of intelligence and autonomy allows that X to be multiplied manifold. And if the relationship, the inverse relationship between firepower and intelligence hold, then Artificial intelligence and autonomy, i.e. hyperwar, present opportunities the likes of which we've never seen. So for example, do you need to blow up a tank or can you fly into the barrel of a 125 millimeter gun uh, with a much smaller charge? If you had that level of precision and you had that level of uh, customization of payload, perhaps the latter would suffice in many cases. But these examples abound, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is not in the kinetic domain, it's actually in the information domain. One of the things that we've now got with the ability to make decisions so broadly and to automate these decisions is that we've essentially created a new domain, but 
the guys in the military haven't really created this domain. Really, it's the politicians that have created this domain, but now it exists, and that is the domain of your everyday information space, whatever you want to call it. Your popular media, things that the population in the country reads, and so on and so forth, what you post on social media. Artificial intelligence is increasingly being used to weaponize the data that's available publicly. It's being used to create profiles, to do very, very micro-targeting. In the book, The Sentient Machine, I talk about mind hacking. And uh, I talk about the need, for example, for AI shields. These are new classes of threats that are materializing because artificial intelligence has been inserted into this process. In these short remarks, I can't do justice to the full breadth of what the uh, implications might be. But, but then also um, think about it in geostrategic terms. Another aspect, another consequence of hyperwar, and we've written about this extensively also, is that it changes how we see the world. One of the principal ways in which we've evaluated the military potency of any country is, for example, the number of able-bodied citizens it can field and make part of a military. And that is also going to change. You see states in parts of the world that are rich, they have access to capital, they could put up dark factories, they could invest in roboticized factories that produce advanced equipment and goods. Uh, and those can now autonomously undertake campaigns. So you still need humans, but what's the multiplier? And what is the capacity of a country that erstwhile would not be able to field any significant threat, any significant capability, but with this dawn of hyperwar and the advent of AI technologies, those calculations change also. So I'll stop at this point, but my, but my opening remarks hopefully introduce you to three aspects. One, a very practical element of where artificial intelligence can make weapons much more smart than they are now and can decrease lethality while still maintaining effectiveness. That artificial intelligence is the principal means of the conduct of operations in an entirely new domain that the military didn't define, the civilians defined, the information space. And third, that the advent of hyperwar opens up a reinterpretation of our geostrategic future by allowing us a new framework and a fabric with which to look upon states that we have otherwise perhaps not thought of as importantly or some that we've given too much importance to. The framework is adjusted and therefore the rebalancing, at least the mental rebalancing now needs to take place. So with that, I'll conclude my opening remarks. What have you seen as some of the biggest challenges and maybe what is the biggest opportunity we have uh, to actually bring hyperwar to the field and the fleet? I'm going to try and talk really fast because there's a long list. Um, <laughs> but I, I have to say that uh, our partnership with DIUX, by the way, has been fantastic. And DIUX played a huge role in opening that first door. Uh, our partnerships also with Boeing and with uh, General Atomics have gone really, really well. And with some other um, you know, traditional uh, uh, suppliers that, that we'll announce here shortly. On the cyber domain, artificial intelligence and cyber, both for defensive and offensive. We have a product out today called Deep Armor that's totally machine learning based. It blocked all major zero day threats that came out over the last six months. Um, and the flip of that is an offensive capability that's available only to certain clients. But my point is I can go on and on and on the technology of hyperwar is real. It is consumable in various different levels of readiness. It is consumable. I think the comments that were made earlier this morning at the keynote, the comments that I had the good fortune of making in Brussels to the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, and that, that I will go and repeat again here in, in the next month at the NATO summit, uh, the comments that I've made to former uh, Secretary Bob Work, and everywhere where I could find people that I thought have influence on this process, we've got to fix acquisition. There are many good ideas in this country. We've got the best universities still in America. AI was born in America. We still have the largest number of AI researchers in America. But if you let these ideas die on the vine, what's the point? 
uh, that is a disconnect that needs to be resolved. DIUX is a huge step forward in that. SCO, huge step forward in that, but more. There's more ideas than there are organizations with bandwidth to take them somewhere. And as somebody that represents industry, uh, but really more than that, I, 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 I could probably take the technology that we have in different areas, and we do. I mean, national security is one of our areas, but we also have financial services, which is a reasonably large business for us, and also energy and uh, industry manufacturing, which is a reasonably large business for us. But I care about national security. This is a key focus. I spend a lot of time thinking about this, and I'd like for it to succeed. So I think one area where we do need some help is figuring out some guerrilla mechanisms to get this the, this acquisition business taken care of. Uh, once we do that, I think we'll have a leg up. Thank you.